Hello and welcome to another episode from the Synapse e-learning series. With us today we have Prof. Jean Kalea Juice, gynecologist with an interest in infertility and the head of the Department of Anatomy within the University of Malta within the Faculty of Medicine and Surgery. Thank you, Prof, for accepting to be here with us today. It's a pleasure. Thank you for the invitation. <laughs> we will be discussing um, embryo freezing and IVF today. And in fact, this brings me to my very first question. What constitutes embryo freezing within in vitro? Vitro fertilization in this process. Okay, Mena, it obviously depends on the legislation that you're working in. But um, what we mean by embryo freezing is when the embryo, which is created during IVF, um, uh, either by purely IVF, where the embryo um, forms in the petri dish um, following the fusion of the sperm and egg together, um, and then the embryo is grown in culture for three days or five days or six days, depending on the protocol where you're working on. Um, and then the embryo is frozen. So the reasons why the embryo is frozen, again, depends on the protocol of that particular unit. And judging from data acquired from international research centers, um, how does the process of vitrification and cryopreservation of the embryo affect the overall um, viability of the embryo in there? Okay, I'll just go one step back just to explain the differences um, between uh, cryopreservation, like slow freezing, and vitrification. Now, first of all, embryo freezing is a science of its own. Okay, and although not practiced in Malta, I mean, obviously, as an embryologist and as a person who you know um, uh, teaches embryology to medical students and to other healthcare professionals, we have to be knowledgeable about it. I mean, so we know exactly what we're talking about. Now, embryo freezing has traditionally been done in countries where it's allowed via a process called slow cryopreservation, so slow freezing. So there was a technique, um, it involves quite a lot of equipment, a lot of time, and that's why it's called slow freezing. Um, but traditionally, at least for the, I would say, last 20 years, it has been the main uh, way that embryos were preserved. Um, however, in the meantime, people who had issues with embryo freezing, um, particularly because of the surplus of embryos left in the freezers um, by couples following their successful IVF, um, a move in the science has grown where gametes started being frozen, particularly the egg. This, uh, up till 2010-5, unfortunately, egg freezing was an issue. Why? Because people were trying to freeze eggs in the same way that the embryos were being frozen, that is by slow freezing. But that couldn't be applied to the egg because the egg, after being taught following a process of slow freezing, was not good for, for insemination. Um, the cytoplasm, the nucleus, was not you know, of good quality in that case. Then, a science was born where vitrification of oocytes started, and vitrification, although it's a process of cryopreservation, preservation, it's completely different from slow freezing. It's actually a process which is faster, um, it's easier to learn, um, and it uses different methods, so it uses different solutions to get this um, egg frozen. So that is oocyte for the vitrification. Um, Oocyte vitrification, which started, as I said, around 2010-5, took off really quickly because it was finally um, the solution on how eggs could be preserved. And uh, that's why there was a move also um, for a number of units, which were not even in those countries where embryo freezing was allowed, but there was a move for storing eggs. And remember, at the same time, there was a growth in the social freezing. Social freezing, should you feel? Social freezing means um, that, for example, if you have a 20-year-old medical student, for example, um, who wants to have babies in the future, but not for now, um, she you know, um, could have the option of freezing her eggs and then returning for them when she's 40 and, uh, you know, she wants to have kids. Really, that social freezing aspect has also grown over... So it's actually, you, you freeze the oocytes to exactly. suit your social yes, needs. Yes, uh -huh. yes, and that is, um, that is also a growing um, science, and particularly there are countries and units which, you know, just do that. Anyway, so because of this oocyte vitrification, and people then try to apply the two-side vitrification to embryo vitrification. And uh, although still many units, because of the investment they've done on the slow freezing of embryos, still do the slow freezing, 
but embryo vitrification is slowly, slowly being the method, like the way forward. Um, and that now brings us to your question, like the uh, survival rate of these embryos. I mean, so the survival rate of embryos who have been frozen and then thawed, I mean, it depends on many things. I mean, first and foremost, it depends on whether they've been frozen using the process of slow freezing or vitrification. So when you're looking at papers, if you see papers by 2005, they're quoting slow freezing methods. Even if you see papers which are more recent, they would also be called, I mean, a number of units will also be using the slow freezing, as I said, because of the equipment they have, and obviously they're using that. Um, therefore, that makes a major difference. Another difference is um, when the embryo has been frozen. So you can freeze an embryo at day three, right? And you can freeze an embryo at day five, which is the blastocyst. So day three would be the cleavage stage, we call it. And day five would be the um, blastocyst, or even day six, which would be the zygote, meaning the blastocyst would have hedged from the outer lining, which is the zona pellucida. Um, most uh, which one is the more favorable then? The most earlier? Units, uh -huh. Most units, actually, where, they, where embryo freezing is allowed, actually they go for day five, which is the blastocyst. So you have big centers, let's say, let's call the UK, Belgium, um, you know, the big European centers, they normally go for the blastocyst. Why? Because the difference, what they do basically is, you know, if a woman um, has produced a set number of eggs, so let's say she has 10 eggs, which are mature, and they are fit for freezing, they are fit, sorry, for, for uh, insemination. All those 10 eggs would be inseminated by sperm, all right, and then they will be grown in culture for up to five days. Meaning that, I mean, all right, uh, in the bigger units, you have these machines called time-lapse machines, which would be incubators in themselves. And rather than having to take the embryo in and out every time to check the progress, you leave the embryos there, and they're left till day five. So obviously, out of ten, those ten embryos, actually, out of those ten eggs that you might have started with, not all will fertilize. So let's say, in a good case, you'll probably have about eight or nine who will fertilize. Up till day three, as the growth of the embryo continues, not all nine will make it to day three. Um, so even in the best scenario, which I'm saying to feel in having the best incubators and everything, it's unlikely that you'll get the nine embryos reaching day three. And even more so, it's unlikely that you get um, all embryos reaching day five. Now, by day five, um, this, the blastocyst stage, it is considered favorable in a situation where you have all eggs fertilized, you're not like a mortal, you can only fertilize two eggs, but all eggs fertilized. Like that, when you reach the blastocyst and you're transferring the embryo into the mother, into the future mother at day five, that would mimic more the implantation that normally happens in vivo. In vivo, the embryo will spend the first five days in the tube and then reach the uterus for implantation at day five. Um, uh, therefore, that's why most units grow the embryos till day five. It's uh, to reach that stage, but uh, you can't start off with just two eggs, because if you start off with two eggs that you have fertilized, there is already a risk that by day three, you might not have an embryo, or if you do, um, uh, you know, it's only one, or it, you might be lucky to have two if they are good eggs and uh, depending on the cause of infertility. Um, but if you reach day five, I mean, there is a big risk that unfortunately the couple would have controlled that process and there is no embryo. Um, uh, therefore, I mean, again, when we come to analyze um, the uh, survival rate then of these embryos, not, if we quote what the big centers do, and which are regulated as well, right? So it's very important that we quote centers which are regulated by their respective authorities. If we take the UK, there is the HFEA, which is the Human Fertilization and Embryo, Embryo Authority. It's the oldest authority because obviously the first IVF was in the UK. Um, if we take centers, um, reputed centers there, um, who freeze at the blastocyst stage, when they tour, um, the, what they quote is 85% survival rate of those embryos post-tour. Survival rate of the embryo, right? So it doesn't mean that there will be 
They will all implant, obviously, um, and they will all lead to successful pregnancies, but at least the survival post-op is 85%. That is very comparable to other European centers, so um, I can give you links to PubMed papers, I mean, which would be in um, high impact scientific journals. And normally, the um, um, success rate of the survival rate, successful survival rate, post or in frozen embryos at the blastocyst stage um, is quoted between 85 to 88%, depending obviously then on the age of the mother, the quality of the eggs, the reason for infertility, etc. But that is what is um, what the patients um, are told, obviously, following audits and evidence um, from that same unit. And that is according to the most recent technological innovations which we yes, have at, the, at yes, this moment yes. in time. And, and having said that as well, I mean, as we speak, new developments would be happening. Very yearly, there is this ESHRE Congress, it's called, um, European Society of Human Reproduction and Embryology. And I mean, I've been attending this um, for a number of years, and every year there are new things, which again, I mean, it's good that there are these new things and new developments, but that in itself does hamper research a bit. Why? Because if a new product is on the market, right, um, uh, you, it's by the next year it's almost outdated so when it comes to going back to try to do comparative analysis using big numbers um, it is an area unfortunately which is so growing that doing proper randomized control trials is unfortunately not always possible okay and uh, yes so that is the main thing with IVF really. But the statistics are there and we've mm -hmm. spoken about mm -hmm. how it affects um, the cry preservation proof, it affects the viability of the embryo mm -hmm. prior to its implantation. Mm -hmm. Now, how does it affect the implantation rate in itself? Okay, Mila. so once um, an embryo is stored and uh, survives the towing, the implantation actually um, according to again evidence from the scientific papers the implantation actually is better but i'll explain why it is better and also the reason why certain units in the uk are actually moving to this type of protocol Mena, what happens is Mena, let's take a normal ivf cycle so the lady the patient the female patient would be stimulated would be receiving medications and hormonal medications to cause what we call super ovulation so that she ovulates more than one egg, she produces more than one egg, which is suitable for ovulation. That obviously will create a very unphysiological environment um, in her um, pelvis, um, because not only the super ovulation, but even the actual pickup, which involves surgery, um, where you have to go in and um, pierce uh, the developing follicles, there will be a lot of follicular fluid and a lot of inflammation going on in the abdomen. And, and even if you're going to go to the blastocyst stage and implant the embryo after five days, still the environment within that womb, within the endometrium, is definitely not physiological, right? And in fact, I mean, that is one of the main reasons that IVF, I mean, the, in the best of centers in the world, like where they, where they can do everything, um, it, it's never beyond 50%. Why? Because so far, we know quite a bit about the embryo, but there is a lot of unknowns, it's a big Pandora's box, when it comes to the uterine receptivity. Um, and definitely the environment created during an IVF cycle, that's definitely unphysiological. So what certain units are moving towards, in particular in the UK, as I said, I mean the UK, I keep quoting the UK because it's the center where it's the area where there has been um, uh, more high tech innovations innovation, and, uh, innovation, and also we tend to call the UK because the centers there are regulated by HFA. So every center has to report what they're doing. It's a very good watchdog, but you know it's important in the situation to avoid abuse, etc. Um, so what um, a number of centers are doing in the UK are that when a woman is stimulated and the eggs are retrieved, all the eggs would be injected with sperm, so all the embryos would be grown um, up to day five at least, in some units day six, but most units is still day five, which is blastocyst, and then all those embryos who reach that stage are frozen. That is called the freeze-all protocol. Freeze-all because you're freezing all embryos. 
Then they wait for the lady to have her period, right? Obviously, once she stops her medications, she'll get a period. And normally, they transfer back the embryos um, in a natural cycle, um, which would usually be two cycles later. So she gets her period, then she waits for another period, and then the transfer is um, around the third period. Obviously, depending on her situation, her age, etc. So in so doing, we're trying to bypass the unphysiological state of a woman after having super ovulation. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And uh, they are getting, I mean, although this is relatively recent, um, but there is evidence that the implantation rate and the live birth rate, which is ultimately what we're interested in, um, uh, we're interested in ultimately the live birth rate. Um, and uh, at least that's what the couple want. I mean, they would want a baby. I mean, so that's how we measure the success of IVF in this case. Um, so the take-home baby rate um, seems to be better. At least these centers which are implementing this, um, they are better. And the rationale behind it is that you are having better uterine receptivity in such cases. On to my very last question. I'm sure that through your work you um, encounter many sensitive issues, many couples who truly wish to have a child, and I mean you have to tackle all these in an ethical and in a sensitive way. I mean, your profession, you, you encounter the most grave cases, but as medical professionals everyone would have contact with a couple uh, which is going through such circumstances. What advice do you give to all the medical professionals out there who are following this video and who come into contact with such patients? Um, uh, what I, my advice is, first of all, the patient and the couple, they deserve to have the, the proper information. So, and it's up to us as medical professionals to read the proper scientific literature, I mean, which is um, uh, in high impact journals, which has been peer reviewed, which is obviously unbiased. And uh, in my opinion as well, obviously everyone as a human being has their own personal, moral, religious beliefs. Um, but in such situations, I mean, as medical professionals, first and foremost, we need to impart an impartial view. Um, we need to give them the information. I mean, sometimes it's true. I mean, it happens with Maltese patients that they ask, but what would you do, doctor, in such a situation? You try to um, not impose your views um, and give them a real, honest opinion on the knowledge that you've gathered from your reading. Or if you feel that you're not knowledgeable enough, at least seek help and um, seek the right information. Um, and ultimately, the patient will, it is their right to do their own decision based on their own moral, personal, religious views. That's my opinion. Thank you for your time, your patience. This was truly an enlightening interview. Um, I hope that this uh, brief episode, brief interview has helped you to further your knowledge on IVF, on embryo freezing, and all, all the issues which uh, basically have to do with this particular subject. I invite you to like our Facebook page and to continue subscribing to the Synapse and following us by liking and sharing this video on your personal Facebook page. Thank you.